All right, so we're going to get started. I apologize for the delay. We were um, out of batteries. The microphone wasn't working. Uh, but we're back in business now. All right, are we ready to go? So we're going to get started here. We are talking about what today? Oh my gosh, the origins of language. Yes, I, um, I asked you to give me something difficult, and so you did. Yeah, so you did. But, uh, but before we move on to this new and exciting uh, new topic that we've got, we're going to do what? Review. We're going to do a review, but we're going to do a different review. A different kind of a, a review. Hi, Peggy. Because we have been on this amazing journey for the last couple of months, haven't we? Yes. What have we been reviewing for a few months now? Maybe two months. The Gilgamesh. Oh my gosh. We've, oh, Trudy, you're, you, you really were fond of Gilgamesh. Uh, I like saying that word. <laughs> it is fun to say. Yes, it is. It's, it's fun to say. Yes. And I think and Effie, and Effie, yeah. likes to do, Effie likes to say Australopithecus. Yeah. That's yes. <laughs> and Pat, you like Enkidu? Enkidu was your favorite. All right. Hi, David. All right. So, yeah, we did. We went through this great travel through all of, well, hominid history, right? Yes. Right? And we started off with, um, yeah, we started off with the first hominid species. And I just said it. Who remembers? Yeah, Australopithecus afarensis. Do you remember remember Lucy? Yes. Yes, you remember Lucy. That was yeah. Yeah, the Australopithecus afarensis, africanus, robustus. There was a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Yes. And Did everyone hear what Dolly said? Yeah. You can't have false teeth and say that one. Yeah, that was a good one, Dolly. That was a good one. And then we went through, uh, we came up through the ages, and we talked an awful lot about Homo erectus, right? Yeah. One of the most successful species for hundreds of thousands of years. And they're the ones that made the, remember the, um, the Olduwan tools? Yeah. Hi, Joanne. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so we, we took a look at Homo erectus, and then we came up even further into uh, time, and we looked at the hominids that coexisted along with Homo sapiens sapien. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember this particular uh, photo that I put up here? Yeah. We yeah. were all amazed by it. Why? Do you remember why? Excellent, yes, excellent. Because we do not have the biggest brain here, do we? No. All right. All right, so yeah, we were pretty much amazed by the fact that the um, modern human had a smaller brain um, than the other two that were coexisting with us. Uh, but we took a look at that, right? And we realized uh, that what they're saying is that the the that the focus of the Homo sapien sapien brain was where? The frontal lobe. Excellent, Barbara. The front, frontal lobe. And what does the frontal lobe do? Think. Yes. Think. Process. That's the processing center. All right. So it was concentrated in the frontal lobe, and that was the difference. And then we moved on, and we were looking at what? Yes, hunter-gatherers, exactly. We looked at hunter-gatherers. And we also looked at the early Natufian tribes. Remember, they were doing a lot more gathering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they had storage houses, didn't they? Yep. So we unearthed, I mean, I didn't. I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, but they unearthed um, in these archaeological sites in Israel, the early Natufian people, and they were storing large amounts of grain. And so people were starting to settle temporarily because then they had to go do what? Hunt. Hunt. Yes, exactly. Yep. 
All right, so then we kept going further um, up in time and we started to take a look at what? Early farming. farming, exactly, yes. Yes, the early settlements, the early um, permanent settlements, and that would be located in what's this called? Russia. Excellent, yes, excellent. And we also took a look at the fact that these civilizations, these early civilizations, all appeared right around the same time, right? Yeah, so, so not, not far after and all in this particular area here. And, and we also looked at the Americas. Now, when we saw this, as we were looking at each one individually, we took each civilization individually, we could have spotted some what? Similarities. So we're going to take a look at those similarities. Let's take a look at that. Because there's a big question that comes along with that. One of the most predominant similarities is these independent civilizations all seem to have what? Farming. Farming. And was that the most convenient thing that they could have been doing? No. No, it wasn't. No, anthropologists do not know why people started farming, because farming's hard. And the, the gathering was plentiful. It was easier to gather than it was to plant. I think All right. Tired of rolling around. Yeah, maybe they're tired of moving. Well, but you could gather in a. Remember, they were gathering. Remember, the Natufians had semi-permanent locations, and they could gather because it's the end of the ice age, and there was flourishing vegetation at that time, and so it was much easier. That's why they had these huge storehouses, because there was plenty to gather. So farming is a phenomenon, and anthropologists, archaeologists really don't understand why people did it. And yet, in all of these civilizations that are thought to have uh, risen up independently, what do they all do? Farm. They all start farming. Yeah, yeah they all. But there's got to be a reason why. There's got to be a reason for that. Yes. Yes. Another. All right. So another thing that we saw that, that rose up in every civilization except for one was what? Tools. Yeah, tools and weapons. Do you remember the civilization that did not have, well, they just haven't found it yet. It could be there. Which one was that? India. Excellent, Edith. India, yes. They didn't find any, um, any weapons, but weapons are everywhere else. Everyone else seems to love the weapons. All right, and then we also see all over the world what? Oh, megaliths. Megaliths, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes. So they're all rising up with these gigantic uh, stone structures independent of one another all over the world. Is that curious to anybody? Yes. It's very curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's super curious. The other thing that they all seem to have been very, very interested in was tracking the heavens, right? Mm -hmm. Did all these civilizations have calendars? They do, yes, they have calendars and they have to track the seasons and they have, we think that they're doing that because of the farming, right? right? Yeah, you have to know, you have to know. The other thing that we saw that was similar going straight on through all of the cultures was there was a polytheistic belief system, mm -hmm. all right? So everybody seems to have had many, 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 many gods, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's interesting, except there were anomalies. Do you remember the anomalies? Yeah. All right, so we took a look at these anom anomalies. We have, in ancient Sumer, uh, do you know that they have a monotheistic belief system that's ancient? Zoroastrian. Yes, Zoroastrianism. It's a monotheistic belief system and it's thousands and thousands of years old. It still exists today. It's, very, it's got a very small uh, population, but it still exists today. And then we also had monotheism in what? 
India. Yeah, Hinduism. India, yes, exactly. Yes, and Hinduism. Yeah, it's a monotheistic, even though it appears to be a polytheistic. And then there was one more weird outlier of a monotheistic pharaoh. Do you remember? Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Amenhotep, Atenaken. You remember him? Yeah. I'm sure you all remember him. No. Yeah. Yes, right? The pharaoh with the very big hips. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you remember him. All right, and he worshipped one god, and it was the what? Sun. The sun god, yes, it was the sun god. Another thing that comes up everywhere all over the world um, frequently is what? Oh my gosh, there are pyramids everywhere. Pyramids everywhere, all over the world. Um, here's a few. Egypt has over 300 alone, just Egypt uh -huh. has over 300 pyramids. But here's different locations all over the world of pyramids and their different styles. Yes, what, what a curiosity that is, that this particular shape, that this particular thing would appear all over the world in all these different cultures. And then another thing that they all did was they all wanted to build their great what? Cities. Yes, they all wanted to build their great cities. And last week, we ran out of time. I had one of the Mayan, uh, great Mayan city, and we ran out of time, and I said that I would show that to you this week. And if it works for me, that's what we'll do right now. Sorry about that.
I love those reconstructions. Aren't those great? Yeah. Oh my gosh, they're just so, so they're spectacular. I just absolutely love them. So that was the Mayan reconstruction. Uh, what that country I, is that? Mexico. Yes, uh, that was the one from last week that we didn't have time to get to, and so now I've kept my promise to you. John, do you want to come sit over here? Or right there, wherever you like, wherever you want to sit. Okay, so you, um, so you can see that they can reconstruct that. I love what they do. They show you the, the ruins, and then from paint resin that they still have, they can um, pretty much guess what it must have looked like at that time. All right, so they're building cities. They're, all these civilizations are building cities. And then another thing that they're doing as they're advancing, advancing, is they're, they're wanting to communicate. You saw the scribe there, the Mayan scribe, just in that reconstruction. Well, before that, what did we have? Hieroglyphs. Yes, we had petroglyphs, hieroglyphs, right? This one, you can, re you can identify this, yes? Mm -hmm. What's that? Egyptian. Yes, I'm sorry. I meant I meant the culture. Yes, this is Egyptian, and and this is um, uh, Mayan. This is from India, and this is from ancient Sumer. Look at these. Aren't the, look at those. Aren't they interesting? What is that? Doesn't it? It does. It really does. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really does. Yeah. Yes. This. Yeah. Submarine. Didn't um, Next to the bird. wait a minute? Didn't George Jetson fly something like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's what I was thinking. Maybe this is yes. Maybe this is future yeah. instead of past. All right. So that's yeah. That's ancient Sumerian um, uh, petroglyphs. All right. So now we've got these things. We're looking at all of these similarities, but it begs a question, right? What is the question? When did the literature start? Well, the question is, all right, so this is what the world looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how can all of these civilizations throughout the world have any kind of connection? How could they have any kind of connection? So it has to have risen up independently, right? Because they couldn't possibly have done what? <gasps> but they're having to rethink that. Remember, they're having to rethink that. So um, getting out onto the ocean and surviving is being re-evaluated by anthropologists. Look at these old ancient um, seafaring crafts. We can't possibly have them anymore because what would happen to wood over hundreds of thousands of years? You can't have, yeah, yeah, there are only very specific conditions under which wood would be preserved, right? But now they're starting to think maybe they did. And maybe they did as far back as Homo erectus. Does that blow your mind? Yeah. Yes. That's what they're thinking, as far back as Homo erectus. This is very convenient. Look, he puts the strap over his forehead, mm -hmm. right? You can just carry that around with you. Yeah. Yeah, jump on the ocean and go. <laughs> yeah, right? I liked that one. Okay, so we find all of these similarities, and there's now um, a little glimmer of hope that that maybe they will entertain the idea of people having been on the ocean and communicating across the seas a lot earlier than uh, we originally thought. So those are the similarities. What is the difference? <coughs> what is the difference? What does everybody have unique to themselves? Language. language, exactly. Everybody has their own very unique language, right? Do you know that right now there are over 7,000 languages spoken? Over 7,000 languages. And of course, we all know how that happened, right? <laughs> how did that happen? Who scattered the people? Yes, right? Yes, yes, Tower of Babel. It was after the flood. They built this big 
thing. Yes, and that was not, God didn't care for that. And so he, he confounded their language and scattered them all over the world so that they couldn't, um, they couldn't get together, put their heads together and come up with ideas like this, right? Yes, but no, I mean, <laughs> so, that, so that's one of the theories that, we, that explains all these different languages. What are the most popular languages? Yeah. Yeah. Really? I'm just going to let everybody seems to be enjoying this slide. I'm going to let you all uh, look at that for a little bit. All right, so then now we want to know. No, it's Roland? Oh, this is recent. This is a current slide. Yeah, this is current. Like French language was more. Oh, absolutely. At some other time. Oh, absolutely. Yes, Bob. Does this mean that English is first language up there? It's or? the most. It's the most popular. The most used. Yes, but. In the world. Down below, we can go to the we can go to the other languages, and they they're bilingual. Yeah. Oh yeah! You know, oh absolutely. We as English or English are not as bilingual as people in other countries who have had to learn English. Yes. Yeah. So is this this is saying just that English is the most spoken, so right. Yes, English is the most spoken. English is actually the business language. So if you want to do business anywhere in the world, it's you're gonna to need to learn English. So yes, English is the number one most spoken language in the world. So how did it all start? Where did this all come from? So let's take a look at some of the theories on how language originates, okay? Which is the reason why you all came here today, and I made you wait like 40 minutes before I got into that. <laughs> all right, so let's look at some theories. Okay, so some of the theories of how language begins goes all the way back to bipedalism. If we are bipeds, we have free use of what? of our hands. And so what we can do is we can now gesture, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we all understand gestures. What is this cute little girl saying? Hello. She's saying hello, oh, right? Goodbye. Yeah, hello or goodbye. But look at her facial expression that's going along with that. So that so the two combined, we can get that and that's universal. We're all going to understand this. What about this one? Stop. Stop. That means stop. Yes, we're all understanding that, and she too, no, <laughs> she too is using facial expressions to let us know that she means serious. business. Yeah, she really truly wants you to stop. Okay, but we don't even need the facial expressions, do we? Because we have um, other gestures that we all understand. And then there are some even more predominant gestures that I couldn't put up here for you. <laughs> that would be very clear, right? Very, very clear gestures that we all understand. All right, what about, what about this? Yes, yes. And it, it emotes something in you. We understand what this means. What about this? Yes, and it's submissive. So any bow, any kind of bow, what are you doing? What are you saying to anyone in front of you? You're giving up power. You're giving up power. Exactly. Yes, that you would be giving up power. That's exactly right. All right, and then we're also able to use our face to express a great deal, aren't we? Right? Everybody can tell uh, exactly what this guy's feeling. Yeah. Yes. Yep. 
Yep. So, and we took a look at this when we were doing, when we were looking at um, Neanderthal. Remember the brow ridge? Yeah, remember the brow ridge? We lost the brow ridge in Cro-Magnon. In Homo sapiens sapiens, the brow ridge was gone, and then I had to bring back the eyebrow girl. Remember the eyebrow girl? Yes, the little eyebrow girl. So we're able to use our, our uh, I know. She's so great, I had to just bring her back. And we're able to use our face to communicate, to express. So they think that using our facial expressions along with gestures was the beginning of a language. All right, but what about speech? What about speech? Now here, it, in my research, it got a little bit dry, but I thankfully came across this gentleman right here. His name is Daniel Everett. All right, he's a... Um, he, he's a local guy, actually. He is from, he's from uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, currently. He's, he's worked in several different places, but currently um, he's a professor of cognitive sciences at Bentley in Waltham, so he's not too far. But he was also absolutely fascinating in his research, and he presented it in a way that was very engaging, and I really enjoyed his, his lectures. In fact, I think I'm going to buy his book. Uh, because I really did enjoy him and his, his research. Now, this is a man who is really a fan of Homo erectus. He spoke glowingly about Homo erectus. Um, he just thinks that they're wonderful, and we know that, if you recall from a few weeks ago when we were talking about what creates language in the human being. Do you remember? The hyoid bone. Remember the hyoid bone? in the human and that's what creates language in us and so other species also have a hyoid bone but it's not exactly the same as the one in the human being so the uh, ability to speak therefore would not be the same what happens with our hyoid bone do you know what happens it doesn't, well, you know what happens? The hyoid bone, it's the only bone in our body that's not connected to another bone. It's attached by muscles and ligaments, right? And then what happens is it's high up, it's high up when we're born, and then after a few months, it drops down. It drops down, and that creates a space that gives us a greater range of verbalization. We have a greater range of verbalization. Do you know that an infant, when the infant is born, they can uh, breathe out of their nose while they're drinking <coughs> their bottle? Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, it is good. I mean, they can, they can do both. Yeah. All right, they can, do, they can do both. We can't. We can only do one or... Um, the other, but they can, babies can do both, and then eventually that bone is going to just drop down, creating that space, and that is a little bit of a risk to us, isn't it? How, why would that be a risk? Choking. Choking, yes, we have a, uh, we, yes, we are, we have a choking risk. We can choke, but is it worth the returns that we get on this ability? Because what are we able to do? Speak. Speak. Yeah. Yes. Wow, sometimes it's not, not worth it. Sometimes it's not worth it. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yes, that is, ab that is definitely absolutely true. Okay, so that makes us, we are the only species that have that drop in the bone, we're the only ones that have that. And that allows us the range of vocalization that we have. However, all right, Daniel Everett wants you all to know that that does not mean that Homo erectus or other species couldn't speak, that didn't have language. And the reason why he's uh, so adamant about that is because of his field research. 
It's fascinating, all right? So he's gone out into the field, and there's a tribe out there in the Amazon, all right, that he has spent 30 years with these people. He has spent 30 years researching these people. They have, the women have 10 sounds that they can make, and the men have 11 sounds that they can make. And from these 10 and 11 sounds, th this tribe has a fully functioning language. A fully functioning language. I'm going to show it to you. I've got a little clip so you can hear him conversing with the tribe members and speaking this language that only has these sounds. Three vowels. And these vowels, um, in the research that I have done, these are uh, constant. You'll find them in every language. Or right, but other vowels may be missing, but these three are always there. All right, this is, these are the only sounds that this tribe makes. And yet they have a fully functioning language. Let, I, want you, I want you to hear it. As his fluency grew, Everett began to realize something was missing. The Pitaha have no words for colors, no past or future tense. And incredibly, I, I don't guess I, 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 I don't report. the Pitaha have no numbers. I, I, I Research from MIT indicates the Pitaha may be the only culture on Earth without any numeracy. The Pitaha don't have numbers because they don't need them. They survive just fine without them. Somebody asked me once, you mean Pitaha mothers don't know how many children they have? Well, that's exactly what I mean. They don't know how many children they have, but they know all of their children's names and they know all of their children's faces. Uh, they don't need to know how many children they have to know who their children are and how they feel about them. Yes, yes. So with these 10 or 11 verbalizations, just these 10 or 11, think of what you can do. Think of how much you can do. These people are able to have a complete and fully functioning language. They communicate, they're, um, they survive in a very um, unhospitable environment, and they're successful. So he's saying you don't necessarily need to have the range that we have. They, don't they have it, they don't use it. They don't feel they need to use it. And so it was possible, therefore, therefore, it would have been possible for Homo erectus to utilize the verbalizations that were available to them that they could make and have a functioning language. Huh. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. But there's more to the story. There's always more to the story, right? Yes, there's more to the story. In addition to our hyoid bone dropping down, we also have a gene. It's called the FOXP2. It's in all kinds of different species, um, but ours is just a little bit more evolved. All right, it appears about 200,000 years ago. And it's what helps us process what we're learning, all right? So when you see a mother speaking to a baby, what's the baby doing? Mimicking. Imitating. Mimicking, it. excellent, yes, imitating, uh, uh, reproducing what it's learning. It's called mother ease. All right, so the baby, so the baby is just now the baby can learn because of this Fox P2 gene. The baby can learn how many languages? All, all, all of them, all. exactly, exactly. And this is an infant with a completely brand new brain, right? Mm -hmm. But is capable of learning all languages if 
it is if they are exposed to it. All right, so this baby is learning the language that the mother is teaching. Now this next baby, I need a little help with this. If you could all give me a hand and tell me um, who taught this baby what? <laughs> <laughs> on here. I guess this was on the internet. Annette was telling me it's called the Yoda baby. Yeah, yeah it's called the Yoda baby. Yeah, so I just wanted to share that with you because oh it was so funny. Can you imagine my surprise when I was looking for babies and I came across this? So, yes. So whenever I have something fun like that, I want to share with all of you. Yes. All right. So now a baby at birth can learn, is capable of learning any language and it's because of that gene it's because of that gene the fox p2 gene and they can um they can regurgitate the sounds because eventually right because uh, they have what the hyoid bone exactly exactly right what happens when the, something goes wrong with that gene talk yeah and the learning process it's really tied in to learning so not only is speech impaired and sometimes impossible but the learning process is affected by the fox p2 as well I've got a little clip here of a little girl um, this little girl has an anomaly in the fox p2 gene she's just as cute as she can be and I want to share it with you Everyone around the world is needing you, and they all love you, and they all think you're amazing. Yeah, they all think you're great, and I bet they are all super jealous that I'm getting this hug right now, because all of them would want this hug too. What do you want to say to all those people? I love how you're touching my face, because I know for you it's a way to say hi, and it's a way to show that you're comfortable around me. And I am also comfortable around you. Whenever I make a new friend, I always give them a high five. So if you would like to be friends, all you have to do is give me a high five. We're friends now. <laughs> really good friends. Can I have a big hug? How about it? Yeah, I thought so. Oh my god, I just love her. I love her. I love her. But she has an anomaly in the fox p2 and she is not able um to speak she's not she fixed that? It, no, no no well not yet hopefully they hopefully they will be able to yeah it, you know language is something that is still very very much a mystery and they're still doing a lot of research on that i've i've worked with several people that were nonverbal. um now, babies have their own language too. They can communicate. Twins do. Yeah, twins. Well, just just babies, just babbling to each other. They know what they're saying. We don't. David. What happens to that gene as we age? <laughs> it gets louder. It makes your voice get louder. <laughs> Right. No, I it just, it's, I, I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I, I would assume that it just remains the same in us. Um, but yes, an anomaly would be a mutation. I guess All right. you haven't had any anatomy classes lately. An, uh, uh, um, it would be a mutation that would then, that would then, you know, affect generations to come. All right, so do other animals have the fox P2? No. no. I don't think so. No. Oh, they do. They do. Oh, they absolutely so they do. You couldn't train them. The, you ha there are, um, well, let me see. Let me just tell you this. There are only two amino acids away from a chimpanzee and a gorilla and the human fox p2 
two. What does that suggest? I mean, imagine that for just a minute. Imagine that for just a minute. There are two, just the difference between the fox P2 in a human being and uh, fox P2 in a chimpanzee and a gorilla is two amino acids. If you somehow develop a way to add those amino acids, that means that they could speak? Well, it would take, it would probably take a long time for it to develop, but yes, Trudy? Yeah, but primates do have a, like, can have a language, sign language. Oh, it's so ironic that you would say that. <laughs> because, Coco. has anyone ever heard of Coco? Coco? Yes. All right, we all know Coco, right? And what is Coco famous for? Sign language, yes. Yeah. So I have a little clip of Coco. Coco passed away in 2018. Did you know that? Yeah, she passed away in 2018. But I have a little clip of Coco and um, her best friend. I was going to say trainer, but I don't think that's quite right. It's her best friend. So let's take a look at Coco um, speaking to her friend Penny. Who is that? I think me there. Okay, that is you. Gorilla. Animal. Coco Love. Okay, that's very good. That is you. You are a lovely animal. When Penny Patterson and Coco, a western lowland gorilla, met nearly 30 years ago, neither had any idea they would become friends for life. In the long history of human-animal relationships, their story is one of the most fascinating. It is the true tale of a young woman and a gentle giant walking hand in hand into a whole new world of understanding. They couldn't have known that their intimate friendship would shatter century-old stereotypes and change forever our outlook of both gorillas and ourselves. Penny describes her friend with gentle honesty and affection. Coco's about five feet tall. She weighs roughly 300 pounds. A little heavy for a female. The average is 250. She's a big female gorilla. Coco has a, a very strong sense of self she um, feels she's important. She's got a strong ego. She's playful, very, can be very silly. <laughs> quick spin. A quick, a really quick spin. And then once you're good and dizzy, <laughs> send you off. She's got a good sense of humor. Oh, no. A monster. A monster coming to get the alligator. <laughs> she can be very stubborn, uh, very s willful. Finish. You are not finished. <laughs> you are not. You are not finished. You didn't do the work. I asked. Please pick those up, Coco. You are very good at that. Please pick them up. Their up. relationship is like no other. Penny <laughs> and Coco are the first human oh, and gorilla to share a common language. Penny taught Coco to speak sign language. Play with them after you help. Okay? No, no, not fake. No. What? Their exchanges, their conversations were enchanting and quickly revealed the power language has to build a bridge between our species. Then you go and you bring those papers. When I look into Coco's eyes, and other people have said this, that they're, they're changed forever, that there's an exchange of intellect and emotion that, that we get with another person. 
Coco's looking, peering into your eyes and questioning you and asking you and getting information from you, drawing you out. She can do that because she has sign language. By teaching Coco a language humans can understand, Penny armed Coco with a powerful tool that allowed her to speak as an ambassador on behalf of her endangered species. Astonishingly, Coco is willing to provide us a window into her life, her mind, and her heart. Who could have imagined that a gorilla could fall in love with a kitten, search for a mate, and yearn to be a mother? She has challenged us to acknowledge that we share this world with other intelligent animals. There is very little difference. Genetically, it's what, 2%, something like that. When I tell people that we have the same number of hairs per square inch as great apes, they go, no, that's impossible. Or that we have the same blood types. Oh, come on, you know, that's not right. But it's all true. Isn't that amazing? Can they estimate an IQ on them? <clears throat> I don't see how they would be able to. They wouldn't. Yeah, I don't, th I don't see how they would be able to do that. But it's yes, Trudy. Something that I find interesting is that they have taught other primates, side yes. who in turn will teach their children, which blows my mind. It do yes, it blows my mind too. So did everyone hear what Trudy says? So, the, so chimps will learn sign language, they will teach their young sign language, who will teach their young sign language, so who knows? Maybe, may, maybe you know, it's starting the development of these amino acids that they, that they need, but it's all, it's all just uh, completely mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Do you know that um, Coco, one of her favorite TV shows was Mr. Rogers? Oh. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and so guess who she got a visit from? Oh. Mr. Rogers. Yes, yes, I, always, I almost put that clip in there for oh, you to see, because that was very, like, completely adorable, too. Mm. All right, now, uh, we've got to wrap it up, because it's uh, about 4 o'clock right now. So next week, I want to tell you the story about a language you might be familiar with, that came this close to going extinct. And it wasn't that long ago. And the language that very nearly went extinct was English. And I'm going to tell you the story next week of how that happened. All right, thank you all for coming, and I will see you next week.